It's great to be here. Thanks to the GDevCon team for everything. Uh, we'll be doing some polls a little bit later, so you can use that QR code to, to get there. Uh, this presentation, so Steve Watts, who's not here, but did, you know, kind of help instigate the first GDevCon in Cambridge. Um, uh, he and I have shared this trait of going down rabbit holes reading old computer science textbooks and t papers and things like that. And so this kind of came out of that, where we were reading some papers about modularity and so on. So, so that's where this thing came from. And I actually, you know, submitted this several months ago and then kind of forgot what I submitted. And I knew, knew the title, but I didn't know what I was going to talk about. Um, and so then I, a, f a couple of weeks ago, I said, well, I should really read what I submitted and try to make sure that it matches. And so yeah, what I submitted was pretty good. Uh, you know, so I'm, uh, it was, um, I still don't know what I'm going to present today, but you know, it seemed like a good topic. Um, uh, I also, so you know, there's AI came up twice yesterday, came up in Eric's and in Nancy's presentation, they both gave a history of AI. And I kind of felt like, well, one, I was there during the history of AI. And so I felt like there were some people that were, that were left out of that. You know, so like I think Eric said, Alan Turing, kind of the inventor of AI. And I really view it as more people like Marvin Minsky and Newell and Simon and John McCarthy at Stanford. Those, to me, are, the, are more of the people who invented AI that were actually doing things in the 50s and the 60s. Um, first boss I ever had is a guy named Woody Bledsoe, who, who uh, was a professor of mathematics at the University of Texas, and then he created the computer science department. He was um, president of the American Association of Artificial Intelligence uh, back in the 80s. Uh, he, his uh, his uh, speech as president of the AAAI was uh, I had a dream, and he, his dream was talking about all the things that AI could do, and if you go read it today, it actually is just as relevant about what AI could be used for, what good it could do, um, but also with some of those same warnings that we have today, too. Uh, the other thing, when I was thinking about AI, and I just added this slide yesterday, um, is that when I was at NI, at NI Tech 2000, which was an internal R&D conference, I did the first presentation on artificial intelligence at NI. Um, and uh, I thought I'd actually revisit some of those slides real quick uh, to talk about what are the things that we thought back then. Oh, let me get it to present. Oh, keep going. Dr. Signal is still a good idea. I still talked to Karsten about this, but let's... <clears throat> uh, what tools do you think of when you hear AI at NI? Natural language processing, computer vision expert systems, machine learning. So this is what we were thinking 24 years ago. Um, uh, code generation and wizards configuration. Uh, some of this stuff actually made it into DACMX. There's some things like signal routing and DAC designer that were there was going to be an expert system inside of DACMX until I helped kill off that idea. Um, but anyway, so all this was stuff that N.I. talked about um, uh, a long time ago um, and is finally getting around to doing something about <laughs> Nearly there. Okay. So first up, our giants are female. Um, you're getting two of them today. The first one is a woman named Annie Ford. She just finished riding her mountain bike from uh, Baja, California to Whistler up the western coast. She's a marine scientist. She used to work in the um, oil and gas industry as a marine observer. And uh, basically, she, she's from Australia, she's from South Australia, and um, uh, she ha has, besides being a marine scientist, she's also this amazing mountain biker and surfer and has this world record holder. Um, but she's been fighting, she's been raising money to stop seismic blasting in the southern ocean uh, south of Australia, which is, you know, decimating the sea life in that area. So that's one of the, uh, our giants are female that I wanted to highlight. Uh, she has an Instagram channel right there. The other one, which I, we're using this one from NI Connect. If you were at NI Connect, you saw that if you were at my presentation, you saw this. Cole Brower, uh, um, 
a couple, I guess a couple of months ago, just finished being the um, youngest, well, first woman, first U.S. woman to sail around the world nonstop alone. Um, and uh, she uh, beat, she was in a race with what? It says um, 16 competitors, 15 of them were men. Uh, she's five foot two. They, they, she'd uh, been part of another team, and they basically said, "You're too small to, to sail, do ocean sailing, ocean racing." So she proved them wrong, and um, you know she just finished uh, second place there, uh, in, and finished in a record for her class, even of men or women. So I wanted to highlight her. That's her Instagram right there. Okay, who am I? <clears throat> Let's see. What do I say? Um, so LabVIEW, I've been working in the LabVIEW world since the dawn of time. Um, LabVIEW champion, CLA, uh, and professional instructor. I worked in the LabVIEW R&D team. I know how a lot of LabVIEW works inside even today, uh, even though it's been 10 years since I actually, well, 15 years since I touched any of the LabVIEW source code. Um, I'm on the Opera, Austin Opera Board of Trustees, so I care a lot about uh, that organization. Um, the things I'm passionate about are things like team culture. I've worked at, so NI had a great culture. I worked at a company called Athena Health, it's just healthcare, IT. Uh, amazing culture until it completely disintegrated and, and collapsed. Um, so I care a lot about team culture and organizational structure that supports that team culture, and then the people management that goes along with that team culture, and then good software engineering processes are just something I, I've always cared about, even at NI, and created some of those engineering processes when we didn't really know what we were doing, but we knew, to, knew we needed to do it better. So, first poll comes up. So, pollev.com slash bhpowell is somewhere. Um, let me know if you can't see it. So it says I have 74 responses, <laughs> but it's not showing up on the slide. That's a shame. We'll figure out something when it gets a little bit later. Uh, agenda, why is modularity good? Uh, we're going to talk about modular organizations, and we're going to talk about modular behavior. So that's the plan. Um, so this is going to be a question uh, to you. Why is modularity good? Let's see if I actually see anything. If not, I'll switch to the web page, and we'll do it that way. Reuse seems to be winning. <laughs> yeah, coupling and cohesion. I don't, I don't know if I see cohesion up here, but coupling definitely see that. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, y'all can keep going on that. I'm going to switch back to the presentation. Fine. Okay. So, uh, one of the papers that I was reading was called Design Rules. There's actually a book called Design Rules. There's Design Rules 1, and now there's a Design Rules 2. Um, and then um, there were papers written by the author about design rules, so design rules past and future. Um, and I, I really like this quote. The, the, uh, he was doing basically an economics financial business view of um, systems and like looking at disruption, things like how, you know, DEC with uh, microcomputers or mini computers disrupted IBM and then microcomputers came along and disrupted the mini computers and so on, things like that. So the virtue of a modular system is that its components can be mixed and matched to achieve the highest value configuration in a particular setting. So the modularity the fact is the, the, the value is that you can mix and match and put the things together the way that are, make the most sense to you. 
to you, the person who's putting those modules together. Um, and so that last sentence, the essence of modularity lies in the options it gives designers to postpone and then revise key decisions. And so I'm going to harp on that for a little while. Um, but th that to me was like, oh, that's a really, that's telling me what the value is of, you know, I see these things, I like the way this is put together, or I don't like the way this is put together. And a lot of it has to do this, well, when do I have to make the decision on, on uh, what I'm going to do in my architecture, what I'm going to do in my organization. If I can postpone that decision as much as possible, uh, that's a good idea. And, I, and Dr. T, Dr. Touchard, who was the founder of NI, had this thing. I, I'm not sure if I remember exactly the words he used, but it's essentially like this. You always find a decision invariant path forward. Like go forward, but uh, do it in such a way where it doesn't matter what the decision is. So if the decision changes, just keep going forward and hopefully, you know, you don't have to change too much. You know, the more you can not box yourself in a corner, the better you are. And so that's one of the things that I think modularity gives us. Um, so uh, modular designs create options, but modular designs can also evolve. Like those are the two things that I want you to, to come away with. Um, so, what do those mean? Development can proceed opportunistically and incrementally with each module on its own semi-independent trajectory, right? So we think about um, open sourcing the icon editor. Thanks, Jim Kring, wherever you are. Um, you know, that is basically letting the icon editor have a different uh, semi-independent trajectory from whatever LabVIEW, NI, somebody else wants to do. Because it's now its own separate module, its own separate source code, its own GitHub repository, so it's independent. And that's an example of that. It's creating an option by spinning it out and making its own module. Um, modular designs can evolve. So design change is driven by search processes that we use on deciding, is this a good approach or is it not a good approach? You know, and that's based on me as a developer of the module or a user of the module, what is good? Um, sometimes that's me imagining what it, how it's going to be good. Sometimes it's um, you know putting it into practice and seeing what works and what doesn't. Um, so that survival of the fittest uh, is what allows us to continue to evolve on these modules. Um, but it takes place within, you know, like the icon editor is an example of, well, it's still in this LabVIEW ecosystem and still has to plug into LabVIEW. So it's not completely independent, but um, there's a place for it to evolve. All right, so let's talk about modular organizations. Um, so this is where I think I wrote, I don't know, maybe 15 or 20 slides about what I thought you and I should do. Um, and then I said, well, you know, the right people aren't going to be here from NI. So I'll still, I still boiled it down to one slide about what I thought NI should do. But that's part of what this is. But I also think it applies to all of our organizations. It certainly applied to the organizations I've worked with about how to make them more modular. So let, what traits would a modular organization have? And so I may need to go activate that. Let's go see. Uh, how do we go to the next one? Next one here. Activate. Flexible keeps showing up. Interfaces, that's an interesting, yeah. Adaptability, that's a good word. Communications. And somebody said interfaces earlier. Who said interfaces? Somebody want to acknowledge that? Okay, what do you mean by that? Yeah, 
Yep. So a modular organization, still, you still need to define those boundaries. Um, you know, who do I talk to when I want to do something? When or I want you to do something, or I want you to help me do something, right? And so defining that communications authority is also an interesting piece of that puzzle. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, a lot of times you build a modular organization, but you don't, don't define those interfaces, and so then you end up with um, uh, just more confusion. It's like an isolated module because there's no way to ask, you know, like, I feel sometimes that way with NI. It's like, oh, who do I go talk to at NI to go uh, open source the robotics module? So it turns out it's Sergio. Um, you know, because I talked to Eli, I talked to Eric, I talked to um, uh, somebody else, and you know, and so they all kind of lead here. And so yesterday I said, here's why you should open source the LabVIEW robotics module. But that's like, you know, get, you know, I think, Having you in that role is a big step in have, defining an interface. But still, there needs to be a public interface of here's, if you want to do these things, here are the people you can go talk to. Um, so let's see, what else? So independence, you know, we talked about um, semi-independent trajectories. I think that's a really important, you know, having, being able, the module gets to choose what's right for that module. Um, to a large extent, independent of what may be good for another module. Um, let's see, respect. That's, a, that's an interesting thought. Respect, some of that's respect for the boundaries of those modules, um, of those parts of the organization. I, I need to respect that this is your job, that you know, your job is to go and figure some of this stuff out, and I'm not gonna take that job away from you because you have that job. And so I want you to have that authority to be able to do that and not steal that from you. Um, okay, we'll leave that running, and then we'll go back to the presentation. Which still doesn't have any responses. Okay, so next question is, do you work in a modular organization? And so let me go activate that one. So it's a nice bell curve we have here. So I, I'm kind of curious on the two extremes. Um, we'll start with the absolutely not, do not work in a modular organization. Uh, what to you is, uh, one, does it work? Um, what are some of the pain points that you might have? What are maybe some of the good things about it? So anybody, Alan, you wanna? It's me and my intern. So, I mean, I'm a modular one, which is by definition, only, by definition not modular. Yeah. It works just fine because we're very, very, very small. Okay, so this is where we ask you to leave the room and then we get Megan's take on. <laughs> 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 we'll talk later. <laughs> yep. Yep. Okay. Anybody else in a absolutely not modular organization that wants to uh, offer anything up? Okay. Somebody at the other extreme, definitely modular, flexible organization. Who wants to talk about what's good, why it works, how does it work? Talk about that. 14% of you said you're in such an organization. Nobody wants to admit, okay, right there. So this actually wasn't what I voted for, but um, working in a startup, especially a small group of people, like everybody knows what all the rules are for everyone else, and that's where I could see that being that, in that category. Yeah, yeah, so small startup, um, 
And I would say at, at some point that startup, no, it may still be a startup, but it's no longer a small modular startup. Because right. I worked in like a 100 person startup that wasn't modular. Right, but I could certainly see like then you're in one of these 10 person startups where everybody has to do every job, you know, or be able to do every job. Right. And then you start to figure out, okay, you're good at this and you're good at that, but I can help you if you need that. Uh, Aaron, I think you had a comment. So I'm also the one per person organization, but answered the opposite because for me, the modularity is mindset. Am I willing to adapt to changing requirements? Am I willing to, or am I going to just say, no, this is how we're doing things and just bull straight ahead as this is the only correct approach versus being willing to say to adapt. Yep, that's a good point. You can be, it, it, a lot of it is your behavior and how you wear your different hats as your sole proprietor. Um, I try to do that same thing too. Okay. The interface to the module that is Alan C. Smith or Ellen, Aaron Gelfand is the interaction to our business, our contract with our employers. And that's, that is external to us and what we do. Any module, in software, a module can do whatever the hell it wants inside the module, right? It, it, has, it has effectively no rules except the ones the designer imposes upon it. So I, I think that's, Aaron and I are, are, are probably in violent agreement, but it's a semantic difference as to whether, and as, as, as to, he's, he, Aaron, I think you're, you are equating modularity and flexibility, and I, I'm actually making the opposite argument that when you have a single entity, you're by definitionally a module of one. And I think that's true in our software too, right? Just for the parallel example, right? You get to a small enough module and it's the atomic unit. So how can, how can that be any more modular than that? Or how can you make that modular? Yep. I, I, I do think that y'all are in violent agreement. Um, but I also think that there are organizations that are uh, absolutely not rigid that don't function well as, as well as yours does, right? Um, axis of discussion. Right, exactly. Yes, exactly. Uh, uh, can I add one more thing? So I didn't feel like we got a strong answer from somebody that felt like they, their organization was really modular. I, I'm, I'm loving the company that I'm working at. Uh, the, each person and each group has very defined roles, and there's like handoff, uh, defined handoffs of uh, uh, information, whatever your value package is between groups, and uh, and the processes are really well defined. And one of the great things that it uh, that it one of the great benefits is that it that can scale really easily. So if a particular project or even just the company as a whole needs to scale, uh, then you just add more modules and everybody understands how that works. Or you add people mm -hmm. to the team that, that fall into a particular role, that team can scale and everybody understands what the inputs and outputs are. Yeah, and, and defining those interfaces. That, that reminds me, and we'll get to you here, don't forget, we'll, we'll, we'll get to your microphone. Um, when, when I was a manager on the LabVIEW R&D team, I don't remember what year this was, but we, we it kind of switched from a, like when I first started in the LabVIEW R&D team, we had two rooms, two small rooms, windowless rooms. Everywhere. There was, there was uh, the front panel room and the block diagram room. I was in the block diagram room. Um, and so that, our interface was a door in between. That's how the interface between the front panel and block diagram worked. Um, but eventually we started, we grew to a point where we, we created different teams that were responsible for different things, as you, such as a user interface group. And I was, I managed the, what we call the LabVIEW measurements group, which, which um, LabVIEW internally within an I had, had grown to this thing, uh, you know, where all the other parts of the company have to interface with LabVIEW. Right, that was, that was just something Dr. G said. You, everything has to work well in LabVIEW. Um, but the interface to the LabVIEW R&D team wasn't well defined. That, that how do you ask the LabVIEW R&D team to do something for you? And in reality, the answer was, whatever you're asking for, the answer is no. <laughs> that, you know, LabVIEW has its own priorities and, you know, your priorities don't matter. You know, if we can do something for you, great, but if, if we're not going to go out of our way. Well, the LabVIEW measurements team was 
part of our mantra was to switch that around so that the answer was yes. So every team that came to the LabVIEW team, uh, we would figure out a way to accommodate their needs. And so a lot of that was like what went on with DocMX. All the, the things that enabled DocMX from LabVIEW were things put together by my team. Some of the things like the waveform graphs and the digital waveform graphs and the digital the waveform data type, the timestamp, all these things were created um, to say yes to what the doc team need or the vision team need or motion team or whatever other team. And the other piece of that puzzle by defining that interface is, um, you know, there were big parts of NI like DAC, data acquisition, modular instruments that could usually force LabVIEW to do something for them. But then there's all the other small groups like vision and motion that like represent a few percent of LabVIEW's customer base was motion. But if you flip it around and look at what percentage of motion's customer base was LabVIEW, it was like 98%. And so anything that the LabVIEW team could do for motion had a huge impact on the motion profit and loss. And so that was why it was important to default to yes instead of default to no when other teams came and interacted with us. And so by defining that interface of just being our team was the interface to ask LabVIEW to do something for you, that really opened the door for a lot of improvements that uh, we were proud of. Jörg. Actually, and surprisingly, I have a serious question. <coughs> when, you, when you think about modular organization, do you have people in mind and HR and how they are separated? Uh, because it sounds like most of the answers revolved around being a team of one, which means something. But that's only one aspect, I guess. The other aspect is like the responsibility or the tasks or, or like the whatever it is. So how do you see that? I mean, I do see it. I mean, it's all it's, the companies are made of people, right? So absolutely, I see it as people. Most of my experience is working in, um, you know, I worked in two billion dollar companies with thousands of employees, and I worked in a hundred person startup, and then I worked for one person thing. So most of my experience has come from the large organization stuff, and so. That's what I really have in mind, is how do you create modules in that organization? And so what, what I'm about to talk about is kind of how it doesn't work if you, if you think of it as a, a billion dollar company, company as, a, as a monolith, right? Just like it's a problem with, well, a giant healthcare IT project that I worked on that was a giant monolith, it had a bunch of problems, but you know, how can you refactor that into something that's better? So is it? Test, test. Is it fair to say that it boils down to separating people into groups? Is that the, the essence of it? That is one approach. It depends. As you know, I like to say. Uh, it is a common approach. Okay. So, segue to the next part. So, uh, one of the reasons I left in I was this question. Um, so NI at the, you know, I left NI 10 years ago, so NI is different today um, in many ways. <laughs> um, but one of the things that, that I was f always frustrated with was, you know, somebody comes up with a good idea and some VP somewhere says, but can it scale? Like it's got to scale to the NI, entire NI customer base. Um, you know, it's got to, it's got to scale to the entire employee base. Whatever it is, it's got to scale. And so I believe that's one of the, the um, decision paralysis problems that NI had that led to some of the mistakes that NI has made is that it had to scale, right? And this is the monolith, right? This is whatever you do, you know, oh, I want, I want a LabVIEW, uh, I want, the, like, the field architect program was me and Nancy and a guy named Charlie Knapp in California. There's three of us. And we uh, showed how what we were doing, which was basically helping customers get better at LabVIEW, meant that they became better NI customers that bought seven times more NI products than other customers. Uh, and we had that question, but can, you know, how does it scale? It's like, well, we need to hire, you know, a hundred 
Brian's and Nancy's and Charlie's. Uh, and even then, that's probably not enough to scale worldwide, right? Um, so therefore, we're not going to do it at all. Like, we're just going to kill off the field architect program. And, you know, that's when I decide, well, it's a good idea, and it's so frustrating you're not going to do the good idea because of this question right here, right? So that's, that right there is more or less why I left an eye um, out of frustration with that. I do not believe that this has to be the way you operate. Um, so, the, to me, the opposite of that is modularity. Um, you know, it goes back to that Carlos Baldwin thing. You know, basically I can mix and match the good ideas and put them together. And so, for example, like the field architect program, maybe you just do some of that somewhere. You, maybe you just do that in the large accounts. Let's just go hire five or ten field architects and go and do it that way. It doesn't have to scale to every customer in our, in our database. Um, it doesn't have to scale to all large customers. It could just be a good idea that's one of the many things that a company does. Right? So this doesn't just apply to NI, it applies to a lot of companies that I think have this decision mindset of, you know, I, I can't have like these small groups that are doing these things that are independent of, you know, everything has to scale. Everything has to work universally everywhere within the company. I do not believe that is true. I think that kind of goes against what uh, Carlos Baldwin um, has. Okay. I can't remember if I hid the next slide. I may have hid the next slide. Let's... Nope, I left it in. Um, so well, this is one of the things I kept telling several people at NI Connect, uh, NI people, is like, I still see some of that old NI mentality some, in places at NI. And that needs to change. Um, and so uh, I'm hopeful that this will change, that Emerson will have more impact, you know, impact on how NI operates. But I do think that there can be some modular good ideas. Um, so examples are... Uh, like, outsource all the good ideas that NI is not going to work on. Open source them. Icon it, LabVIEW Robotics Module. LabVIEW Robotics Module, last updated in LabVIEW 2019, 32-bit. You're not going to work on it? Open source it. it we're getting there. <laughs> um, support those things with time, expertise, and money. Academic. Uh, presence for NI, right? Used to be an academic sales force. The academic sales force used to go to universities and help ensure that LabVIEW is successful there. It was a lot like the field architect program, which is why I actually reported to that manager for a while. Um, uh, you no longer have an academic sales force, but don't just walk away and leave and, and just let it wither and die. Leave, you know, leave, leave it for dead. Instead, Take some of that money. You don't necessarily have to fund it to the level you used to. Um, but pay for partners to go to your university and support LabVIEW. Um, uh, they'd be willing to do it. They're maybe not willing to do it every week for free. Um, so there's that. Uh, so some hints. Lab Community Training Initiative. Academia. Open source products. Hey, look, LabVIEW Robotics. <laughs> 64-bit LabVIEW is my favorite NI product I worked on. That was so much fun. There were three of us. Does, does Dowd still work at NI? No, so we're all gone. Okay. Um, modular behavior. Okay, we're running out of time. So um, how does this affect what I do every day? So here's your question. Let me switch over to the slides. Earth to activate. How do you create modular code? And your choices are uh, top down or bottom up. And so do you um, create the VI and then you start creating sub VIs? Or do you um, have a reuse library that has everything that you need in it and uh, start to put everything up. I think Derek has a question if somebody wants to run a... Sandwich. <laughs> uh, oh, the sandwich approach. Yeah, a little of both. Yeah. Well, that's why I made this a, a one or the other. You know, I just was forcing people into a camp. Um, 
and it's more or less 50-50. Uh, um, I'll see if I can, well, I'm seeing the numbers come in. It's 45% A, 50, now it's up to 59% B, bottom up. 41 to 59, 40 to 60, okay. And then just on time, I'm going to keep going. <clears throat> okay. So remember this, modular designs create options, modular designs can evolve. Um, and so let's talk about the search processes you use to evaluate these things. So how do you evaluate a modular design? So that's our next poll question. So let me switch. That's our last poll question too. And so it's activated. Let me... Stop the slideshow so that it will. <laughs> what happened to that? It depends. Oh, yeah, that must have been my joke. <laughs> There's your answer. So you all voted correctly. Um, it. And thanks, Jörg, for setting up the earlier part. Okay, home stretch. Let's see. Okay, so here's some things that I wrote down in the it depends category. So maximum reuse, you know, especially if you're building a reuse library, you know, that's, I'm gonna do things that are gonna be most reusable. What I need right now, absolutely a viable way of evaluating whether it's a good module or not. Um, I also believe like one of the things I tell, tell people about hardware abstraction layers or measurement abstraction layers is like the first one doesn't count because you only have a, unit, a, a case study of one. And the second one, you start to have an idea about what get, makes a good abstraction layer, but it's really not until you have a third and you've moved from the point to the line to the plane. Now you're getting a better idea about what that abstraction layer is going to be. Um, is it similar to what I've done in the past, which I think is another reuse thing. Performance, simplicity, flexibility, and then this, this ability to change my mind and do something different. That's actually something I thought of a week or so ago. We were having a discussion about DQMH, I think, with Steve, with Steve Watts. And um, one of the things that he said is like, and you know, Steve Watts does not use DQMH. He has his own LabVIEW component-oriented design approach. Um, and it's not that he's not a fan of DQMH, it's just he doesn't use it. Um, uh, but he says, you know, the, the faint praise for DQMH is that you, you almost never hear of anybody completely screwing up their application by choosing DQMH. <laughs> and it's like, well, you know, it's so... That was a British yeah, that was a British compliment. Very nice, very British. Um, but this idea of, I can change my mind halfway through the application and... I don't have to rewrite everything. That's one of the things I like about LabVIEW object-oriented programming is I can pick and choose where I use it. I can use it just here, and the rest of my application doesn't have to know anything about OO. Um, same with DQMH is that, you know, I can choose to have a DQMH module in my application, but I'm not committing to this framework everywhere for everything I'm going to do. Um, and so I like that idea that, that decision invariant path forward is like, well, I'm going to choose DQMH, but... Um, you know, I may change my mind later. And uh, hopefully I haven't uh, boxed myself into a corner. The flip side of that is sometimes a good module is something that's imposed by my framework. And so, you know, if I'm building an actor, uh, you know, a, and I'm going to be working in an actor framework mode, having something that looks like an actor that just plugs in right here is a, is a great way to evaluate um, that. Another one, solid principles, who, who doesn't know what solid means? It's okay, you can raise your hand. Okay, so, you know, um, Uncle Bob Martin. Uh, I don't really like solid because I think it's really hard to remember what solid stands for. You know, Liskov substitution principle. Now, okay, it's, 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 yeah, we remember what it says, but we don't know what it means. Right, you know, which uh, Liskov substitution says that I can substitute one and, and not change the behavior. <laughs> um, 
you know, so, but that's, you know, there's some, there's some good ideas in solid, and so that kind of object-oriented thing is another good evaluation criteria. Um, besides, it depends. What are some other uh, evaluation criteria you decide on what makes a good module? Raise your hand. Fabiola. <laughs> you didn't raise my hand. <laughs> but I knew you had something to say. I always have something to say. Um, what makes a good module? What makes a good evaluation criteria, criteria for what is a good modular interface or design? Or Can something? I test it easily on its own without having to create a huge hardness? That is a big one right there. Yeah, everybody's nodding their head over here. So yes. Yeah. Can I test it without having to um, <laughs> Mock up, a, mock a bunch of modules, or set up a bunch of hardware, or something like. I just want to test this timer over here, but no, I've got to have all this infrastructure. Um, and that's something that you know, you this sort of test, thinking of test from the very beginning, which is one of the other things I like about DQMH is that testing is right in your face. Um, what else? What are some other evaluation? Right, Kevin. Ease of use through debugging. Yeah. Um, can I debug this thing? Can I understand what it's doing when it's misbehaving, or when I think it's misbehaving, uh, or what it did when it died? That's right. Or <laughs> you know, developer versus executable RT. There's a whole lot of yep issues yep. that may perk up. So yeah, once it's deployed, you right. know, now what's it doing? <laughs> exactly. All right, uh, over here. When you come back to it six months to a year, or you're onboarding new hires, how long does it take to remember what the hell you did? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I often wonder that about code that I've written. It's like, what was I thinking? Um, though one of the things I say about the code that I wrote when I was in an I, some of the, there's some of the code that I wrote in LabVIEW that is still in use today and still will be in use for another 10 years. I don't know if it should, but, you know, it was simple. It did one, you know, did very specific, clear things and was very focused. And so that kind of idea of focus of what this code does and um, it's kind of a coupling cohesion thing. But you can come back to it years later and it still does the same thing and you can still see that, how that works. Uh, is there another one? Okay. Alan. How good is its boundary? I.e., how... how how much can I ignore what it's doing internally and just deal with it as an API? Yep. Yep. Chris? I think you can easily inspect it for cohesion, right? Or you could see if it's a hairy terminal block or something, or yeah. just think I about, th like, what is it doing? Yeah. I think it's part readability, part debugability, so on. Serge? Uh, what is the average proficiency of the audience that will be maintaining it? How yeah, good is that audience that will be maintaining it yeah, over the time? Like, what is the average and how will it be maintained toward that? Like, yep. And I think that's really important from a reuse library perspective is who's going to reuse this code? And is it somebody who has to be an expert in the framework or an expert in a whole bunch of LabVIEW technology to be able to use it? Or is it just a sub VI I can drop on my block diagram and it works? Right? And that's, again, kind of comes back to, like one of the things I like about OO is that I can have this VI that uses OO, but I can just drop it on the block diagram and have no classes as part of its inputs or outputs. And I have hidden that, I've created a boundary that hides a lot of that complexity. Hunter. Last question. Uh, I find that sometimes I make things modular that maybe I shouldn't have, and we've been talking about reasons that you want to make things modular. What are some of the reasons that you don't want to make things modular, reasons that you're like, I put in a bunch of overhead and I, I could have hard-coded that and it would have been fine? That's a great question. Um, I have my thoughts, but you know, some of you may have thoughts too, but uh, sometimes it's like overly modular, and it's like, it's like almost a premature optimization thing. I think I'm going to need to use these 10 things independently, but it turns out I always use them as one thing. And so I may keep them as a module, but just have one icon that I use everywhere. Um, so I sometimes will see that. And, and it's really only a problem if I start stumbling over those interface boundaries among 10 things, when it's like, well, I, if I just had this piece of information over here, this would all work better. So that's an example of, of that. Uh, any other 
things that anybody want to add. Okay, final thoughts. Um, so, from that earlier quote, the essence of modularity lies in the options that it gives designers to postpone and then revise key decisions. So think about that as you're coming up with your architectures, as you are um, coming up with your modules. It's how can I choose that decision and variant path forward? How can I just keep moving? Move towards the finish line, don't box myself in, use the modularity as my tool for uh, avoiding those um, decisions that force me into specific things. Okay, so with that, I am done. Thank you all very much. <laughs>